Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, and we continue with um, another session. Now with David Leiva and Paco betancourt -Jobet. Let me introduce the speakers. David Leiva is a composer, guitarist, and musicologist. He studied classical and flamenco guitar in Barcelona, completed an MA in music research, and is currently a research candidate at UCM with a PhD thesis on Paco de Lucia's uh, music from an ethnomusicology, eth ethnomusicological perspective. Leiva is director of the Institut Flamenco de Barcelona, teacher in Taller de Musiques and artistic director of Barcelona's flamenco festival, Ciudad Flamenco. He's the official transcriber for Paco de Lucia's music, Antología de Falsetas, 2014, Siroco, 2014, Sirab, 2016, Luisa, 2017, Duende Flamenco, 2018, Solo Quiero Caminar, 19, Cosas Buenas, 2020, and Canción Andaluza, 2023. He has also transcribed the music of Camarón, 2009, Enrique, Enrique Morente, 2011, and Savicas, 2012. He has published over 80 books, Flamenco Guitar Methods, um, etc. As a composer and arranger, Leiva has produced performances such as Rojo Sobre Negro, 2005, Combo Flamenco, 2010, Fuente Victoria, 2012, Morente, and Roach in Memoriam, 2020, Suite de Lucia, 2021, and Suite de la Isla, 2022. Paco Betancourt um, Llobet is a musicologist, guitarist, and lecturer at Complutense University of Madrid. He is the coordinator of Jornada Seminarios de Flamenco at UCM. He studied at the University of Granada before completing an MA in Ethnomusicology in 2004 at the University of Maryland and a PhD in contemporary flamenco guitarist um, at Newcastle University. His research and publications are mainly focused on Nuevo Flamenco from Enrique Morente and Paco de Lucia's Legacy, 2019, to Young Electro Flamenco Producers, um, 2020. He has coordinated and edited articles about flamenco performance spaces, past and present, for Cuadernos de Etnomusicología, in 2023, and about Gerardo Núñez for Revista de Flamencología de la Cátedra de Flamencología de Jerez. He is involved in the research project Mad Music and Lexi Moose, linked to ICCMU, and um, has participated in international conferences in Rome, Mexico, Havana, Liverpool, Kassel, and Tokyo. In addition, he has recorded and produced the albums Electro Flamenco 2007, Mirar Atrás 2015, Mundos 2017, Alchemy on the Air 2019, Canarios y Flamencos 2020, Por la Palma 2021, Concierto Solidario con Ucrania 2022, a benefit concert for earthquake survivors in Turkey and Syria, and Acto in Memoriam Gerardo Arriaga 2023, performing in Argentina, Germany, Mexico, Portugal, Spain, and the UK. And with that said, the floor is yours. Here's the clicker for the power. If you want to go to the next slide. OK, thank you very much. Um, Good afternoon. Uh, we would uh, like to express our uh, gratitude for your uh, kind invitation. Uh, thank you, Meira Golber, uh, Antonio Pizá, Miguel Marín, and the wonderful uh, team who are uh, organizing this international symposium about Paco de Lucia in America, which is part of the Flamenco Festival. Paco. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, well, thank you, everyone, also with organizing, no? It's all the team, no? Uh, just to say, well, after these uh, acknowledgements, just to say, I'm going to do a little brief introduction, around 10 minutes, uh, to, like, a little state of the question. 
And, and later, David is going to speak about Paco de Lucia and Ramón de Algesit in, the, in, Hispano, in Hispano America. But also, we're going to uh, speak about this concept of Iber, Iber America, yeah, or Pan America, to connect some of the things that have been said this morning. Also, uh, David, uh, well, we're going to speak about La Guajira de Lucia and El Cajón, who was mentioned this morning, and about jazz in Paco de Lucia, uh, to conclude uh, about his legacy. Yeah, all this uh, that maybe help us for the little discussion later, no, about this new generation of guitarists. Okay, uh, so, and, and David is going to finish with the presentation of this wonderful book of transcriptions. So, okay. So, uh, okay, I was presenting in this little resume saying that uh, the relation between Paco de Lucia and the America started before this famous encounter that everyone was mentioned this, this morning. Because uh, as when we were speaking with uh, Jose Manuel Gamboa, who wrote this book, Correspondencia uh, de, del Tío Sabica, uh, also Victor Monge Serranito, because Manolo Sanlúcar have been mentioned this morning, or, or Mario, Mario Montoya there, uh, they were learning from the letters, the mail, yeah, that they, it was sent. Uh, but also later uh, we will see like Gerardo Núñez and all this, they learn by. Uh, having th those vinyls play again and again and again, and they were breaking aguja y vinilo y demás for repetition. Uh, we have a, a new, very interesting uh, approach you know, that is coming to, because it was in, in the past uh, always speaking about India you know, and the Punjab, but now it's a new corriente, uh, the, the importance about America in flamenco. And I think Mayra Goldberg with this book and also speaking about the body and et cetera is, is, is there. Uh, also, we had this wonderful uh, translation in Spanish. Thank you to our colleague from Universidad de uh, Alicante, uh, Kiko Mora. Uh, and also there's some very interesting documentaries that I will recommend you to see because if we, if we analyze some of these maps about the American-African slave trade, they always speak you know, uh, like that door of uh, no return that Bob Marley's documentary starred uh, in Ghana. But uh, we have to say that many of those uh, uh, slaves that were brought to, the, the, to, to Cadiz yeah, the same they did with the Wanches, you know, to the ports of uh, Valencia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, well, we, we talk about a little bit about in that, that article, um, but also uh, we want to, to speak from a post-colonial uh, theories as well. Sorry, uh, po uh, post-colonial theories, uh, just to, to speak about this concept of Ibero-America, to include, thank you, Anthony, to include the Lusophone world, yeah, because... Uh, um, obviously, we, we don't have to leave uh, Brazil, no? Because uh, remember, they did this uh, wonderful in reinterpretation of uh, Mañana de Carnaval, for example. So also, uh, not only uh, so so we have this kind of this kind of maps. Also, we have a recent book by Faustino Núñez, this um, uh, f uh, f uh, musicologist, no? Galician musicologist and flamenco expert who uh, is bringing to this line no, that Meira uh, opens up no, about the importance of uh, America in, in, in flamenco. Um, after in a, a conference and concert that, that we did at the Biblioteca Nacional de España, no, in the li uh, National Library or in, in Spain, uh, he presented, that uh, we were playing at the end with Faustino, he presented this uh, conference called Cantes que fueron canciones. And that, that really made me think no, about this uh, research question. We see he presents this wonderful garden that, that he has. For example, on the top, you see the tango americano, the influence on the tango, or for example, El Punto Cubano, La Guajira, also found in uh, Peter Manuel's uh, essay on, on Guajira, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we wouldn't have time to see all this now, but also in the introduction of this book, edited by these two colleagues, Enrique Encabo and Inmaculada Matia Polo, he explained that the idea that many of the, those Hispano-American songs, Ibero-American songs, they became or pieces of a little zarzuela or pieces of a little that the flamenco used to listen and say, oh, I like that. OK, I'm going to take it. It's going to be for me. OK, we, we spoke about that also with um, um, El Negri, no? Enrique Heredia El Negri. 
in that uh, and speak about all those uh, coplas for bulerias and couplets for boleria that, that John was introducing this morning. Um, also, I wanted to mention this uh, research project, no? Proyecto de Investigación, uh, that is connected to music and language. Uh, sorry for, I'm going fast. But if we go back to where uh, pa uh, Paco de Lucia today, this morning, Benjamin, in the paper, was speaking about this entre dos aguas, no? about the meaning of entre dos aguas, we have to, apart from that quote that, that Jose Manuel Gamboa finished that book, no? It's El Flamenco de la Andalucía Libre de España de la Humanidad, no? from uh, the free Andalusia. No? I love that, that idea. And uh, I was thinking about that because I was asking before because many of those songs, my father, who was born in the 40s, like uh, Paco de Lucia, he mentioned uh, he, lived, he was born in Mallorca, like Anthony, but then he, he lived in, in Granada, in the Canary Islands, and, and, Canada, and he said that the Hispano-American songs, they were very, um, estaban de moda, no? they were really in fashion. fashion no? So he used to go to El Albaicín, and he used to go to El Sacromonte to, to play some of those uh, Hispano-American songs. And, and also from, from Gerardo Núñez, as I mentioned, they were uh, taking those uh, vinyls from Savicas. They were coming from the States and learning them by repetition. Not putting them, breaking needles, you say needles? Yeah. Needles, needles, <laughs> etc. That was Gerardo Núñez' uh, quote. Okay, obviously we have, if we do a state of the question, we have here the man who has been written for many, many, many years, these wonderful books, uh, Juan José Telles, y el Retrato de Familia, we mentioned, and we went back to Algeciras uh, last year during the festival with David you know, for um, this conference. It was the first conference uh, about Paco de Lucia. I don't know if it's, it's happening again. So I was wondering, uh, we were talking about the houses, Paco de Lucia's houses and the patios. This is not a photo from Paco de Lucia's patio. It's a wonderful photo by Colita. You know, he recently passed away. But it helped us to, to think in many concepts and also about the idea of the transmission of knowledge. Yeah? Transmission of knowledge, look at those kids, you know, which are learning by oral transmission uh, from the father playing the guitar, the mother singing, uh, whatever. No, the way, because I, I hate in Cordoba when they say, no, because Paco de Lucia didn't know music. What? Sorry, okay, he knew more music than you and me and me, but he learned it by oral transmission. That was the, that was the way. Um, oh, we, we have other, other books which have been mentioned this morning by, uh, about the master plan no? by Porem that he had the chance, for example, like, like Tellez, to interview Paco de Lucia's father. And, and uh, this is from, uh, I was, uh, Looking again to some of the documentaries and films, this is by Paco de Lucia's son, and, and he said that before he learned how to play the guitar, he already knew the music. No? The friends of my father used to come to our house and they used to sing and play on the patio. No? So I wonder which kind of music, because we are talking about bulerías, we're talking about soleá, seguirillas, but also no, related to what we were saying today about the couples por bulería, coplas, Hispano-American songs, which were also in fashion, no? they were sung at those times, no? those canciones andaluzas that David is going to speak later, and the Hispano-American repertoire. Uh, this is another book, obviously, we, have, uh, we need as a reference, yeah? uh, and uh, Apart, they spoke about that. I don't want to repeat ourselves, but you know, the other day we have some new tangos and some bulerías uh, de Pepito y Paquito, no, uh, which were really influenced by uh, um, Ri um, Niño Ricardo. Yeah. Uh, also, I was wondering what about the influence? We are really interested in our research about performance spaces. So, which kind of repertoire was performed? in those venues, no? when we speak about ventas, cuartos, later in the tablaos, you know, today in theaters, auditoriums, yeah, but, but which kind of repertoire? No? And we see some early recordings that we have seen, like this one of Camarón, but uh, then we found, you know, ni uh, uh, Niña, um, Pastori. Niña Pastori and, and Alejandro Sanz then singing in the patio as well. Yeah, this is coming a new article, it will, it will come soon. 
Okay, also I was thinking about El Candela because it was a very important performance spaces we haven't mentioned this morning and they used to meet there. And the, you know, Juan Verdú has this little book, you can read it in one night, it's, even Pina Baus used to go there, Enrique Morente, you know, they used to sit in one table, uh, Enrique Morente, Pepe Bichuela, and the other one, it was uh, Camarón, and like this, it, thanks to Miguel, yeah? Uh, I, I performed there at the times of Octavio, but it became like a, like a, more like a tablao, but when we go down to the little cave that we, used to start playing till six in the morning, seven in the morning, I was looking at those chairs and I was saying, wow, if those chairs could tell me a little bit <laughs> about what happened at that time. Okay, also, uh, for example, when I arrived from, from doing my PhD in uh, Madrid, I started in 2014, it's, yeah, it's gonna be 10 years now, uh, I realized how important it was the Johnny, another performance space where all this avant-garde jazz and flamenco. Well, last concert of Cambrón de la Isla was uh, performed there. Okay, so I don't want to, I leave you with David now because he had the chance during this kind of ethnomusicological perspective to interview his brother uh, and Jorge Pardo Benavent and Rubén Dantas, who was from Brazil. So again, we, we find the Lusophone influence there and we have an amount of other books that we could be mentioning, we will mention later. Also the CDs, the compilations, the books from Camarón and the transcription from Camarón, because obviously Paco's, Paco's guitar is, is there as well. Peter Manuel's article about the Guajira. This article that I rewrote with Eduardo Murillo from Jerez, who is in the Revista de la Guitarra Española, that is about Paco de Lucía's legacy the transmission of knowledge in the contemporary flamenco guitar, uh, that you can have a look. I can send all this article uh, written by David Leiva in Revista de Flamencología, which is called Creation, Evolution, and Relation with America Latina, that I think is really connected to what we're gonna say today. The last two books who came out uh, are these ones, you know, one by a lawyer, but it's very interesting because we have another perspective, uh, and, and these other books, they're more like ensayos, but then we were saying, okay, what about the compositions? What about the music? I, for us, ethnomusicologists, anthropologists, uh, the cultural context is very important, but also we love to speak about chords and speak about this, <laughs> these kind of things. So hopefully we're gonna play. Okay, I leave you with uh, David. This is some of the transcriptions he has done, uh, the official transcription of Paco de Lucia, and later he's gonna finish uh, talking about the, this wonderful book, which is Publish. Okay, so now it's your turn, David. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Paco. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Leo. <laughs> uh, as Paco explained um, in the introduction, uh, Paco de Lucia and one of his oldest brothers, uh, Ramon de Algeciras, an older Spanish musician and the time recorded traditional music of Latin America. Uh, which is fundamental for understanding the multiple periods and the half shape the musical landscape within the Spanish-speaking world. Um, the musical journey undertaken, particularly um, by this flamenco guitarist, in their exploration of folk and popular, uh, popular Latin American music, is evident in the adaptation and arrangement of composition by uh, prominent figures from countries such as Argentina, Brazil, Cuba, Mexico, and Peru. Uh, during his musical career, uh, Paco de Lucia demonstrated his interest in, in a wide range of musical influences uh, that contributed to shaping uh, his musical style. At the age of 16, uh, he moved to Madrid with his family, and later um, that uh, year of 1963, uh, they travel uh, to America to join Jose Greco's dance uh, company as guitarist, uh, which surely has been uh, mentioned uh, previously uh, in the symposium. symposium excuse me. <laughs> Uh, during uh, this experience, uh, both on his rock, uh, record uh, label, uh, and his is very important to add, 
uh, always uh, under the guidance of his father, Antonio Sánchez, who had uh, the idea to make a reinterpretation of Latin American songs. Uh, the two brothers, Paco de Lucía and Ramón de Algeciras, tried to merge these melodies and harmonies with flamenco giving the minute dimension within their repertoire. The versatility of the Spanish guitar in adapting American music and the willingness uh, of the guitarist, uh, Paco de Lucía and Ramón de Algeciras, to explore new lines and uh, research turn this adaptation into a new discourse within flamenco music. As uh, previously uh, mentioned, uh, the musical journey undertaken by Algeciras brother through uh, for and popular Latin American music is material, materialized in the arrangement of the English representative pieces from uh, countries such as, such as uh, Mexico, Cuba, uh, Brazil, per sempre, mañana de carnaval, uh, Chile, uh, Paraguay, Venezuela, uh, Peru, and Argentina. Uh, both uh, guitarists included and choose uh, from diverse. Uh, popular and singers of writing song and clothing uh, them into a flamenco terror, terror, territory, providing them with a different musical perspective, uh, creating a new adaptation and uh, paving the way for a new uh, path in the repertoire for flamenco gear uh, duets, for example, Tico Tico. The modality of flamenco concert guitar duets was not uh, initiated by them, uh, as well all uh, know Sabicas and Mario Scudero, the, uh, the this kind of duos ailer. The guitarist from Alicante and Pamplona, uh, who studied uh, Palo by Palo uh, by Jose Manuel Gamboa, uh, recorded several albums from New York uh, with a flamenco and popular music focus, uh, becoming a ref reference uh, for many guitarists, especially for Paco de Lucia, who met them the, during uh, one of his trips to the city with the dancer Jose Greco. Uh, Greco hired uh, the showman from Algeciras to be, to be the third guitarist in his company and to tour the United, United States, uh, 1963. Um, because uh, his brother was is in the company and his father, uh, 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 brother Pepe de Lucia, uh, wanted Jose Greco to uh, take Paco, Paco as well. Uh, at that time, uh, as a guitarist, Paco de Lucia was influenced by his family playing, but also by Niño Ricardo, a friend of his father. Paco de Lucia composition was family with those by Ricardo, uh, as seen in the documentaries explained by Paco, the advice from Sabica San Mario Scudero, through created uh, his own music led him to consider different uh, approaches within flamenco composition and record production. Um, following that encounter and also under the artistic uh, direction of his father, Paco de Lucia began recording duets first with Ricardo Modrego, Do Guitarra Flamencas en Estéreo, 12 Canciones de Lorca, and 12 Éxitos para Do Guitarra Flamencas. Uh, later, he recorded with his brother Ramón de Algeciras, Canciones Andaluzas para dos guitarras, dos guitarras flamencas en América Latina, doce éxitos para guitarra flamenca and Hispanoamérica. Paco de Lucía immersed himself in the history initiated by Sabica San Mario Escudero, but with much more uh, uh, commercial uh, repertoire, likely uh, devised by the record lovers of the time. The experience uh, was very um, enriching musically uh, for the children, uh, pardon, the children of Lucia La Portuguesa. Uh, during that period, uh, he began uh, composing his own, own uh, pieces in 1967. 
recorded his first solo album, La Fabulosa Guitarra de Paco de Lucia. And um, in 1969, he recorded his second album, Fantasía Flamenca. The arrangement of the composition included in the album Dos Guitarras Flamencas in America Latina and, and Hispan America are conceived uh, from uh, eminently flamenco perspective uh, and proven um, various techniques, um, dynamics characteristic of flamenco playing. Um, the interpretative, uh, together with the profusion, profusion of the technical resort and provided by both guitarists attest to their uh, potential and in innovative figures, uh, figures in the field of flamenco guitar at the time. The primacy uh, of, of Paco de Lucia's main voice over his brother's second voice in carefully uh, management Managed uh, ensuring a strong balance essential for the achievement of high quality versions. Almost all the pieces present both album are complemented um, by background and instrumental, instrumental accompaniment uh, with bongos and maracas, stand out uh, predominant percussion instrument. Additionally, uh, certain seams and electric uh, bass in is added whose uh, harmony fusion uh, contributes uh, to the musical discord as a whole. The composition uh, Tico Tico is a Brazilian song with a characteristic um, short rhythm uh, created, created um, by Sequinha de Abreu. The piece allows uh, to the uh, chink of birth known in Brazil as the Tico Tico, short organizing from Brazilian popular music. In the version uh, interpreted by both guitarists, the original solo rhythm reverses itself and, and as an uh, opportunity to showcase an innate ability and adapt adapting this type of piece. The fast tempo of the original song allows uh, the guitarist to perform an interpretation read in technical resources accompaniment uh, by the constant and fast rhythm Oh, rhythm of the Maracas. So now uh, David, David is going to play a little bit of this Tico Tico version that they did the two brothers. So, so last, just like, like a little fragment. Also he will do of later of the Guajira de Lucia. No, to... Also, okay, that uh, quote was already mentioned about the, uh, you know, uh, he loved to play in America because people is very uh, enthusiastic, no? Will you say that? Uh, and, and the artists, we are um, full of uh, fears, no? And insecurities. And we like to have the response of the public, no? That they, they, they tell you what they feel, no? This is very, when I used to play in Candela, you know, it's like, they always tell you what they, they feel. Okay, uh, also we need to, they spoke about Del Cajón this morning and, and the Chabuca Granda, so it's, it's things I don't want to repeat again and again, but um, uh, also about uh, the importance of the Peruvian Cajón, these two documentaries, is one by, recorded by Javier Limón, where Paco de Lucía explained, you know, that moment that he played in La Feria, and then one month as after, you know, all the sons of uh, Antonio Carmona and all this, they, they have all cajones. And also, we were talking about the Lusophone, you know. We have Rubén Dantas, uh, who was playing at that time, was playing tumbadoras, he was playing bongos. But then when they listened to the, Flam the, the, Flam the Peruvian box, uh, they say, oh, this is the, because it's the, the sound that we make, you know, when we play it on the harmonic tape. 
no, with the wood or the tacón. Yeah? Uh, we have we have seen the development of this instrument. It's, it's amazing. When I used to live in Granada, I had a flamenco cajon at that time, and it was like a box of fish. Yeah. Now, now if you see these kind of uh, cajones, they are like Ferraris. You know, they they, are, they have um, the clavijeros uh, inside where you can adapt the tension of the strings inside. You have bells. You have so have, there's an evolution of that uh, cajon. Um, yeah, uh, then about to speak about the Guajira, obviously we have those books by Maria Teresa Linares and Faustino Núñez, uh, that article that I already mentioned by Peter Manuel. Uh, or uh, if, you, if you can explain, you, would you mind to play? Uh, um, in that book that I found very interesting when I was in, in the UK, because it's a book that David transcribed that is like the singing, the notation of the singing, but also how to accompany that singing. So it's, uh, we find very um, uh, basic uh, chords. We could play Guajira only with uh, A major and the E7. Would you mind to play just basic Guajira, yeah? <laughs> So we have, to, ooh, that's, that's, we have the, the original player here, so we don't need to play the audio. Okay, uh, we see we are in the key of A major, so we basically we, we play in A major. Some, uh, also, you use the second grade, yeah, B minor, and then basically it's the fifth, yeah, the E7, and but also you have that F sharp uh, going to B, that's a domi dominant, uh, dominant, uh, uh, going to that B minor and then that diminished chord, yeah, going back to E. But, uh, but uh, what is interesting, uh, I'm going to put you, because he put the capo, you know, for flamenco, they don't care about the keys. So uh, if the capo brings the strings closest to the frets, then it will be easier. So you see a lot in Vicente Amigo, he always played with the fret on the first fret. So, uh, so I'm going to press, so we listen to Paco a little bit. Okay, so it's very interesting about the virtuosity, you know, that fast picado. It's very interesting that uh, going, would you mind playing that part, David? Yeah, when, that we also found in Farrucas, for example, no? That you have that F to E7 going back to the, the coplas and couplets for Buleria that you were, you were mentioning this morning. So, so, um, uh, we have the transcription by David Leiva in that book called Fantasia Flamenca, but you see here, he transcribed it like playing on the air, uh, but then he puts capo on the second fret. Yes, yeah, so it's one, one semitone up, if so it will be, we will be in the key of B, B major, yeah? And it's interesting, you know, all this, he's not just playing now uh, tonic, uh, subdominant and dominant, but he's playing second grade, third grade, you know, he's putting a more alternative uh, um, uh, harmony. We have uh, other parts from those transcription. We have to say thank you to David Leiber for spending all those nights, you know, <laughs> to kind of create. And could we give him a big applause? Because this is uh, many, many, many years of no sleeping. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, then I wanted to speak a little bit about America and, uh, and jazz in Paco. Very quickly, I was mentioning this morning about all these wonderful collections we have from uh, Radio Nacional es Española. Uh, I was with the students, the UCM students the other day downstairs, and I couldn't believe you know, what they have there. Vinyls, vinyls not to touch, 
just in case they were digitalizing five copies of each vinyl, plus all the tapes and things we cannot even imagine. So um, we were talking, well, I don't want to repeat, but yeah, obviously we have some uh, academic work, you know, related to that book came from the Diana Perez Custodio PhD thesis about the evolution of flamenco through her room, uh, through his rumbas. And, and we see from an organological uh, perspective, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna repeat again, but that use of uh, uh, bongos and we mentioned, uh, put face to some of the mention, that's a very, just, that's the, the baseline, very simple uh, transcription. And at the beginning, when we think of Entre Dos Aguas, we say A minor, B minor, A minor, B7, yeah? And we think, but if we, if we see the structure, that really is for what flamenco, this is what uh, cloud warmth that Norberto Torres is mentioning, is uh, meta-flamenco. Meta what is meta-flamenco? Is to bring the rhythm from one palo and to bring the harmony from another palo. Because, for example, if, if I play, could I play Anito Granaina? Sorry. So, so, so if, no, I'm not going to play if, if we play here. <laughs> He's playing Asturias this morning. Yeah, he's playing. They call it Asturias because they already use the Granada uh, name. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's the reason. He was the editor. Yeah. So, uh, so, so he, what, what he's doing? He's, he's playing that uh, Granadina cadence, but with uh, with the rumba rhythm. <laughs> with a solo, you know, it's only these two chords. Yeah, but it, what is interesting, we see that A minor chord, B minor chord, and we think, oh, he's playing, no, no, then you see he's playing in Granadina uh, chord. Okay, so, so that hopefully will come in. We're writing a, a new book, David and me, uh, thanks to Walter Aaron Clark, is gonna come on uh, Tamesis icon series, so hopefully it will be soon. Uh, um, what else I wanted to uh, I don't want to pass my time with those musical examples. That's a better transcription. You know, you have the rasgueos. You see the, those little arrows, yeah? For, for what, if the rasgueo had, remember the, the tablature is upside down. Yes, uh, it helps, it really helps. And that melody already, I'm not going to repeat again if it was based on La Greca or if it was working Fly the Moon, because, uh, but I wanted to, to focus on that uh, Granadina cadence. Yeah, and that is very interesting because uh, our colleague um, uh, Javier Suarez Pajares found in a, in a Fallas uh, score, he used to write in, in, in pen and he said, How classical musicians will see it, how flamenco see it. So, so that's very interesting because he already knew that what uh, something from a, you know, you, you can think it's a six, a five, three, a four, and three, you know, uh, for, a, for a flamenco, that B is the central of his uh, uh, modality, you know, the, his, uh, como se dice, centro neurálgico, no, his uh, solar system. Okay, so... Um, uh, also, we found that, uh, that uh, Andalusian Academy E minor, as David was saying, you know, in Mediterranean Sunset, it was mentioned in already mentioned. 
Uh, also, we could go back to uh, Lyon and Hampton recordings, these uh, analyzed by Ivan Iglesias, or, um, for example, it was mentioned in Negro Alquimino and, and Fernando Vilches, uh, also that John Coltrane's Ole album. Obviously, we have those sketches of Spain's album. Just to control, and we have this PhD thesis was uh, read in, um, in Granada uh, by Juan Fernando García Vinuesa. It's very interesting because he speaks about the period of freedom in, in, in jazz. No? It's, it's related to the time we were being talking about uh, aspectos transculturales no? in jazz. And also we have the articles by Juan Sagalás and the PhD thesis of Trinidad Jiménez Trini, which is a student, who was a student of Cristina Cruz Roldán, who wrote a PhD thesis about Jorge Pardo. About, it, it's a beautiful name, you say, when the flute became flamenco. This is the name of her PhD thesis. Also, we, we mentioned already once, say, how, Sabica, he already, he already recorded the album that rock encounter, how was that critical with Paco? You know, say, oh, Paco, why are you doing that and what are you doing that? I have to say, when I listen to Paco, not with the septet, but not with the, with the first pan, they sounded, if we, if we think in production, you know, with that bass, with that, it sounded like a rock band, you know? Even if he didn't like rock, it sounded, the wave produced, you know, very punchy sound. Uh, I imagine, uh, uh, they have a lot to say, you know, this musician Larry Correal first, then later with Aldi Meola, and also uh, Chick Correas, that uh, always they remember. Now, and now I start with the legacy part, you know, is that was the last concert Chick Correas did at the uh, Auditorio Nacional in, in Madrid and invited Niño Josele and, and Jorge Pardo, and Paco was always there, you know, he's still there. And now I found that photo, this beautiful photo. They will be dancing somewhere mm -hmm. in, in heaven. And then I went to just, uh, David, to play a little bit of CD apps because we found there uh, now it's not the uh, very simple harmony of the Guajira, but it's just introducing some chord changes from, from jazz, really. So would you mind playing a little bit of the, so you have the structure here. <laughs> change of tonality or modalities in that case. Yeah, we speak about tonalities or we're talking really about modalities. Uh, 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 David did, uh, they use uh, Juan Manuel Amargos, uh, when we, they did La Suite de Lucia, you know, in, uh, in Barcelona, in El Festival Ciudad Flamenco. Um, they use uh, David transcriptions to make the, all those beautiful ar arrangements, you know, with the, where you see that there, the students by La, La Smook, and Taller de Music joined together with professional musicians like Carlen Benavent, or Antonio Serrano, Rafael Dutrera, etc. Et so, so hopefully, Paco, this is what we're talking about, the legacy. No? They also presented also in Madrid with Niño Josele. And, and I was going to say, this was, uh, we saw that photo before, <laughs> uh, that Paco, although he received many awards, you know, like he, uh, Dr. Honoris Causa in Cadiz, in Berkeley School of Music, El Príncipe de Asturias, I think he will be more proud uh, in thinking that the musicians who used to play with him, you know, still just meet up, you know, sometimes like they did in, uh, last month, you know, just to remember him playing his music, you know, the, we see all these uh, young uh, monsters of the flamenco today, 
o eh, you know, Chano, de, de, Chano, Chano Domínguez, Jorge Pardo, ¿no? playing this 10 de Paco. That, that was in the Auditorio Nacional when they brought the eh, Paco sin, sin Vida. And the legacy that the Jorge Pardo still playing his music, Benavent. El, el de la guitarra china, el de la guitarra china. <laughs> and they still playing, they came to Torrelodones. And, and Jorge Pardo uh, was playing and with Tino de Geraldo. And they say, um, and here on the guitar, Carlos Benavent. You know, because he was playing. So he's, no, not just a bass player, as, as a guitar player. And we have uh, seven, eight PhD students researching about flamenco now at uh, Universidad Complutense de Madrid, and two of them, they are uh, researching about uh, Carles Benavent. And about the legacy, which are some of the guitarists from my PhD thesis, Tomatito, Gerardo Núñez, and Vicente Amigo, Juan Manuel Cañizares, um, we see they have followed some of the path. No, that, it's like Paco de Lucia opened up lots of paths, and they have following, no? we see at Womex, for example, here Gerardo Núñez Band is with Perico San Beat, uh, Pablo Martín Caminero, Mark Miralta. He has half, half a jazz band, half a flamenco band, you know, and working together. And this is Gerardo at Complutense and Pablo Martín Caminero playing for, for the students. And it's a shame we don't have uh, um, Riqueni today. We have uh, Alejandro Hurtado that we just saw uh, ahí en el, en el Teatro Alfil, no? in, in Madrid. And I wanted to ask uh, Riqueni, with that idea of Juan Manuel Cañizares de cuando llueve todo nos mojamos, that how much of Paco was in him, but how much of Riqueni was in Paco from those little nights at the Candela. Uh, just the last one, Juan Manuel Cañizares. Well, he also has a train station now, uh, sometimes you go, voy via Paco de Lucia, you know, in Madrid, no, he has his own. But you see also the way of dressing, the ways of, of putting the, the leg, that's uh, Juan Manuel Cañizares at UCM, and Vicente Amigo, uh, I found that photo of Chicuelo. And you know, that photo there is, is to say, es paquero también, no? But I don't want to, I, connected to just some gender is, uh, issues. I want to mention also the female guitarists, yeah? Because uh, while they did this concert here at Carnegie Hall, and you know, they brought all these amazing, all these amazing female flamenco guitarists, they were playing at Villanos all together, you know? And this Niño Josele, or for example, Marta Robles, who played in the Suite de Lucia, yeah? And Jose Manuel Leon, you know, from Algeciras, an amazing guitar player. Uh, Juan Carlos Gómez, no? We, we mentioned otro paquero de muerte. Más Lora. That that was remembering Paco at, at Café Berlín con con Javier Colena playing there with Mario Montoya. Or we put the orchestra to do it. So Paco is also when we go to the hospitals, you know, in this project Musica and Vena, Paco is there with us, you know. And and also to mention uh, Andrea Salcedo, this very young. A guitar player from Jalisco, Mexico. Now she's doing her MA um, at um, the Master Oficial de Musica Creativa, and she has her, her guitar signed by Paco de Lucia. So you, you see, and, and she played this kind of. David Aral, we will have next week, don't miss him. You know, he, she's, he's coming with Sandra Carrasco, but I think he's also going to play with uh, Maria Jose Yergo, uh, new album, very electronic. Uh, uh, and, and we saw them live, you see, this is Teatro Pavón, how they mix together, you know, they, they just play together, and this new space uh, called Villanos, uh, and that, what, that happened, you know, uh, they were presenting this, and I wanted to speak about this, you know, so all these amazing... <laughs> This is uh, connected to the, some uh, jornada that we did about, uh, about uh, issues of uh, gender issues and, and some of these uh, amazing female uh, women. Okay, Mercedes Luján was there, but also, you know, we, we listened to Telles in, you know, in this uh, wonderful uh, 
encuentro, ¿no? like here today, you know, in, uh, in Córdoba, in Barcelona, in, uh, in Algeciras, and uh, otros homenajes, you know, el Teatro Real, or now thanks to the family, uh, we found that photo, you know, if I, what Paco would think of that, <laughs> yes? And uh, just a exposition, so David is going to read just to conclude uh, like a little prologue. So thank you very much. Bueno, si me disculpan, me voy a pasar al castellano. Yo voy a leer el prólogo en castellano, en español, y Paco lo va a leer en, en inglés. Bueno, para mí poder presentar este libro en Nueva York, pues bueno, es... Una inmensa alegría porque, bueno, eh, es la primera presentación, porque este libro salió en febrero y, bueno, he estado muchas horas en la transcripción de Paco de Lucía, es muy complicada, es decir, es un, un gran músico que también requiere tener un, pues, un, un estudio preciso de lo, todo lo que estaba tocando, en qué posiciones, bueno, son muchas horas a solas con los cascos con la música de Paco de Lucía y, y bueno, es una inmensa alegría poder, poder transcribir a Paco de Lucía, que desde aquí doy las gracias pues, por toda la confianza. También puedo decir que, bueno, que fue en 2013 cuando yo pude firmar el contrato, que, que lo firmé con él y eh, con su familia y, y bueno, en 2014 por desgracia nos dejó pero su legado eh, tiene que estar escrito. Eh, cualquier, la música es, un, es una lengua y como cualquier lengua tiene su escritura y yo creo que el flamenco eh, se puede escribir y más cuando es un instrumento eh, trastado, ¿no? de trastes, que se puede escribir tranquilamente. Voy a leer el prólogo. Me cojo el libro. No me lo sé de memoria. <risa> El libro Canción Andaluza, eh, ver la luz en el décimo aniversario del fallecimiento de Paco de Lucía. La profunda conexión del guitarrista argecireño con la copla, que marcó su infancia, se refleja claramente en su última obra discográfica, lanzada de forma póstuma en 2014, como un homenaje a los sonidos que lo influenciaron desde, la, desde su temprana edad. En este álbum, Paco de Lucía imprime su distintivo sello en ocho clásicos de la copla, mayormente compuesto por el poeta Rafael de León. Estos clásicos no solo retienen su esencia original, sino que también revitalizan la memoria sentimental asociada a ellos. Este álbum constituye una reinterpretación flamenca de una música intrínsecamente afín. Canción andaluza abraza de manera definitiva la fusión entre la copla y el flamenco. So I'm going to uh, just read the English translation. This is a book that has uh, that's bilingual. Um, the book Canción Andaluza comes out or is published on the 10th anniversary of Paco de Lucía's premature death. The, the deed connection between the guitarist from Algeciras and the Copla song, which was an important influence on his early years through his mother's singing and through the radio, is reflected on his last recorded album, Canción Andaluza, 2014. This album was presented and performed after Paco de Lucía's funeral as a tribute to those Copla songs and sounds from the past, which were an influence on his childhood. In this album, Paco de Lucía gives his distinctive personality to eight classic coplas, conceptualized as canciones andaluzas, which were composed mainly by the poet Rafael León. Those classic songs keep the original essence, but are also a revitalization of the sentimental memory which is associated when we sing and listen to them again. It could be stated that this album is a flamenco reinterpretation of that popular music, which was also listed and performed by those flamenco families and musicians when he was born. Canción Andaluza is a well-done hybrid fusion between copla and flamenco, though fusion was a concept the maestro did not like to use. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. El disco se inicia con la pieza instrumental María de la O, un clásico de Rafael de León, que ostenta un papel fundamental en el repertorio de Marifé de Triana. 
Esta adaptación se presenta inicialmente con mínimos adornos durante el primer minuto para luego transformarse en una bulería evocando una esencia eh, jerezana. Este tema, inicialmente popularizado por Estrellita Castro con la colaboración de Sabicas, es seguido por Ojos Verdes, posiblemente la copla más versionada del sevillano y previamente interpretada con maestría por Miguel de Molina y Concha Piquer. La interpretación de la pieza comienza de manera efímera con una introducción que oscila entre libre y siguirilla. Nuevamente, esta versión mantiene una esencia respetuosa con el esquema de la composición original en su primera mitad para luego transitar hacia una adaptación por rumba. Los autores León, Quintero y Quiroga repiten en la autoría de Romance de Valentía, conocido por la interpretación de Concha Piquer y memorablemente abordado por el guitarrista en formato de paso doble. Una vez más, se evidencia un respeto escrupuloso hacia la melodía original y los ecos proporcionados por los compositores. The album starts with an instrumental composition, Maria de Lao, a classic by Rafael de León, which had a fundamental place on Marifé's de Triana's repertoire. This singular adaptation by Paco de Lucia is presented in the introduction with very few ornaments on the first minute to later transform the copla into a buleria, which evokes a particular jerezano essence. This song, popular popularized by Estrellita Castro, who had the collaboration of Sabicas on the guitar, is followed by Ojos Verdes, which is probably the most reinterpreted copla of all times. For example, it was sung by Miguel de Molina and Concha Piquet, who were two maestros at the time. The reinterpretation of the song begins with a mix between freedom and the seguirilla playing. Estrella Morente interpreta Te de Querer Mientras Viva. La composición consta de dos partes distintivas. Una fase inicial con una estructura similar a unos tientos, seguida de una transición hacia baulerías. El acompañamiento con un arreglo excepcional establece un diálogo poco común en la prolífica carrera de Paco de Lucía. Este aporte eh, se distingue por la inclusión de frases con un matiz contemporáneo, subrayando la importancia de la composición en el contexto del acompañamiento al cante y por la fusión de los compases 4-4 y 3x4. Esta combinación da lugar a una composición destacada cuya relevancia es especialmente apreci apreciable en el ámbito del acompañamiento al cante. La chiquita piconera es una creación que desentraña con ingenio la leyenda tejida alrededor de, de lo, del cuadro más distintivo de Julio Romero de Tormes. Esta copla, compuesta por Rafael de León para Juanita Reina, añade una nota distintiva al repertorio del disco. Compartiendo una esencia similar con Romance de Valentía, ambos constituyen momentos profundamente arraigados con la música tradicional. En esta amalgama se entrelazan de manera excepcional los ecos flamencos, los elementos característicos de la copla, la melancolía del fado y destellos de influencias clásicas. No debemos pasar por alto que los arreglos de esta pieza están bien elaborados, mostrando un contrapunto muy propio de la guitarra clásica. Resulta relevante recordar que Paco de Lucía también se influenciaba de la música clásica y en este caso nos presenta un arreglo único. Esta adición, eh, adición revela la destreza del maestro en fusionar diversas influencias musicales, creando así una pieza que destaca por su originalidad y riqueza armónica. Again, in the first half of this version, Paco de Lucía keeps the respectful essence of the original composition structure to later travel to a flamenco adaptation, Borrumba, with the rhythm. The famous authors of Copla songs, León Quintero and Quiroga, who were also the writers of Romance de Valentía, well known mainly by Concha Piquer's interpretation this time, is performed by the memorable Andalusian guitarist in a paso doble format. One more time, it is shown or evidences a scrupulous respect toward the original melody and echoes provided by the composers. In Canción Andaluza, the album, Estrella Morente recorded a wonderful reinterpretation of He de querer, he, he de querer, he de querer mientras viva, 
This composition had two com distinctive parts. The first one at the beginning, similar to Tiento's structure, followed by a transition to Bulerias. The guitar accompaniment by Paco de Lucia shows an exceptional arrangement. In this collaboration, the guitarist established a dialogue between the singing and the flamenco guitar, which is not very common in his pro prolific, prolific career. This contribution is distinctive for its inclusion of musical phrases with contemporary touch, underlining the importance of the composition in the context of the flamenco singing and its guitar accompaniment, and for the fusion of 4-4 four, four, and 3-4 beats. This combination makes this reinterpretation a highlight composition whose relevance is seen especially in the guitar accompaniment of the singing. La Chiquita Piconera is a creation where the guitarist unravels with intelligence the legend which surrounds Julio Romero de Torres' most famous painting. In this copla, which was composed by Rafael León for Juanita Reina, Paco de Lucia added a special note to the repertoire of the album. Sharing a similar essence found previously in Romance de Valentia, both constituted moments which are deeply connected to the music from the Iberian Peninsula. In this blend are mixed in an exceptional way the flamenco echoes, the characteristic elements from Copla song, Fado's sadness, classic music influences. We have to take into account that the music arrangements of this music composition are well elaborated, showing a counterpoint typical from classic guitar repertoire. It is essentially essential to remember that Paco de Lucia was influenced by classical music, and in this particular case, he presented a unique arrangement. This incorporation reveals a skill that the maestro had by mis mixing different music musical influences, recreating a music composition which stands out for its originality and harmonic rich, richness. The last bit, we're gonna cut. Yeah, we just, <laughs> just we're gonna, uh, David is gonna read the last, the last bit of the uh, introduction. Desde un punto de vista personal, te la realizar la transcripción y análisis del álbum Canción Andaluza, Puedo opinar que esta obra representa la síntesis musical de la vida de Paco de Lucía. En este disco se encuentran plasmados todos los aspectos de su trayectoria musical, desde flamenco más arraigado en la tradición hasta las exploraciones más vanguardistas, pasando por su conexión con el cante, la influencia con el jazz en sus improvisaciones, su vinculación con la música latinoamericana, la música clásica, la poesía, el fado y la copla. Se trata de un testimonio musical maduro donde el maestro imparte su sabiduría y parece trazar un compendio sonoro de su vida, desarrollándolo de manera magistral. Aunque la imaginación podría dar lugar a diversas interpretaciones, me complace expresar estas reflexiones después de haber transcrito diferentes discos y muchas facetas de, su, de un músico que ha dejado un legado perdurable para muchos, incluyéndome a mí. Quiero dar las gracias a la editorial Jardín de Copla, al equipo Flamenco Life y a la Fundación de Paco de Lucía por su respaldo y confianza en esta tarea de transcribir al mejor de la historia. From David Leiva's point of view, after making the transcription and analysis of the album Canción Andaluza, he believes that this master work by Paco de Lucía represents the synthesis of his musical life. In this album, we can find all the many aspects of his musical career, from the most rooted in flamenco in the tradition of the most contemporary explorations that he always did, connected with the flamenco singing, or cante, the influences of jazz and his improvisation, his connection with Ibero-American music, the poetry, fado, and the copla. It is a mature musical compilation where the maestro de Lucia gives a lecture of wisdom and seems to summarize many sonic elements of his musical life, developing them in a masterfully wonderful way. Although his imagination could think in different interpretations, I am pleased to share these thoughts. After transcribing different albums and many falsetas from a musician who has left to future generations a lasting legacy for many, including myself. This is David Leiva talking, and he would like to thank especially the editor Editorial Jardín de Copla 
and to Flamenco Lives team, uh, and to the uh, Paco de Lucia's foundation for the support and trust in commissioning this wonderful work of transcribing the best flamenco musician in history. This is signed by David Leiva Parados in Barcelona, 2024. The company who are selling these books, they, they did a special offer for the people of this symposium. So if anyone wants to get uh, any of those uh, transcription books by David Leiva, well, there you, you have like a QR there. So thank you very much. That's uh, our contact. And that's some of the reference we have done. And uh, uh, sorry, no, but I, I can send it. I will, I will upload it to Academia do Quedo or wherever you can access to all this presentation. Hopefully, will come soon in a, in a, in a book. The, a wonderful that book that I'm, I'm sure Anthony and Amira will, will do. So thanks again for everything. Thank you. Thank you both. And now we have a few minutes for questions. Anyone? Uno, uno. Eh, muchas felicidades. That was a great job. Awesome. Yo, yo voy a hacer la pregunta en español y en inglés porque eh, yo sé que sería más fácil para usted. Um, so in uh, ethnomusicology, as you know, and in all musicology, there exists a tension between transcription uh, whether it's descriptive or prescriptive. Así que hay una tensión en el estudio de, de escribir nota, poner nota en pentagrama de lo que está tocando un músico para decir si es eh, lo que quería, como el músico quiso, quiso que la música apareciera en, en pentagrama. Y siempre hay una tensión de si es lo que queremos o lo que quiso el músico. And I was just wondering exactly, you know, some of the choices that you made. Um, eh, no estoy juzgando la decisión que hiciste, solo preguntando para saber cómo, lo que fue guía para tomar ciertas decisiones. So what were the things that influenced you to make certain decisions in terms of the transcriptions? And um, also... Uh, uh, Si había algún momento en que pudiste, imagino que sí, hablaron con los músicos que tocaron con Paco para entender cómo él comunicaba lo que él deseaba con cuestión de la música. Por ejemplo, hay unas entrevistas que nosotros hablamos de Alain, que Alain decía que Paco le mandaba música y él lo arreglaba. Y, so, there are musicians who play with Paco de Lucia and he would send them music and they would work on it. So I'm just wondering how all of that informed the decisions that went into making the transcriptions, how you went about, you know, deciding how you were going to represent. In fin, como, como son, más o menos, como, como fueron hecho la decisión en, en hacer las transcripciones, como aparecen como tal, y si había en esta in this process of de apuntar las cosas bien a, a tu gusto, al, al gusto de quizás la familia, los demás músicos, los musicólogos, cómo fue ese proceso a través los, de los miles de horas que pasaste <laughs> <laughs> haciendo este trabajo. El tema principal cuando te pones a transcribir es eh, la guitarra, una misma nota puede estar en diferentes posiciones. Entonces... A veces te basas sobre un soporte visual, que son vídeos, que puedes ver Paco si estaba por, por en vez de la cuerda de la primera al aire, pues si está por el quinto de la segunda cuerda. Pero también he descubierto que Paco lo sabía tocar de diferentes formas. A lo mejor lo estaba tocando de una forma que de repente digo, es la misma falseta y la está tocando en otro sitio, ¿no? Y, y al final yo creo que la experiencia también ¿no? y, y haber tocado tantas, las piezas, tantas veces las piezas de Paco, yo estudiaba con Paco como todos los guitarristas y cuando yo era mi época de, de estudiante 
pues tocaba todas las piezas ¿no? de, de Paco. Y eso también me ha llevado a conocerlo de una forma ya antes de transcribir que ya lo conocía de, en su forma de, de tocar. Sí que es verdad que Paco, hay muchos Pacos, no solo hay de la primera época, segunda y tercera. Eso también te tienes que poner en, en situación, porque si estás transcribiendo la primera época, pues tienes que pensar, pues bueno, a lo mejor es más tradicional, la velocidad, eh, ya a partir de Siroco, pues busca ya esa interpretación clásica, ya no apoya tanto, a lo mejor a veces el picado no es solo fuerza, sino que ya es sutil. Bueno, son muchos detallitos que podría escribir un libro de cómo podría escribir a Paco de Lucía. Es que es el, es el próximo libro. El próximo libro. ¿Quieres sí, yo que, me, me gustaría añadir, sí, so David Leiva is saying that uh, for understanding, for transcribing Paco de Lucía, you have to see the different periods, because it's not the same to, to transcribe an early Paco, ¿no? Uh, with the later, the mature, do you say ma madurez? Yeah, maturity, because, and I think uh, David Leiva, that's why he's doing like eth an ethnomusicology approach. He's trying to combine all those interviews he was doing with uh, his brother, with uh, um, Jorge Pardo, and so, but also is another, is like the, uh, connected to the, um, the technical, the, the technology. He asked the family if he could have, because it's so complex, that he asked the family if he could have the the tracks separated tracks to so so not not to trans to listen you know to try to okay i'm going to transcribe just to so you could play it like we, we can think in a didactic way but you are transcribing using different layers and understanding how how he was creating those pieces uh, send it to alain perez or in the case juan manuel cañizares in that period that i'm sure he was also making arrangements for Paco or Gallardo del Rey, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but yeah, I think he's doing a great job. And obviously, it's that issues about ethnomusicologies, not those shadows on the field, that uh, I think both, no, to have the, the, what we think, primary sources of the people, no, and then combined with the transcription that you can try to get a poem <coughs> in the middle, uh, perdón, ¿He dicho todo eso? No, I, I, I said a little bit more. But sorry, sorry. No, no, but thank you, Benjamin, Another for your question. question and, and Can you tell me, did you, how, what percentage did you use videos to be able to transcribe what he did? Did you have access to videos of him playing? Did you access to the videos? Bueno, los videos de YouTube, por ejemplo, en Canción Andaluza, no, no por ejemplo, no, no, no existía. Eh, entonces... Pues he tirado más de la intuición, ¿no? Por dónde va a tirar. También conocía la, ya la obra previamente de la copla, porque en mi casa también había como mi madre cantaba copla, y yo me criaba mucho con la copla y toda esa copla que estaba en el disco pues, más o menos la conocía. Y, y bueno, he tirado buscando lo, lo, lo lógico también de la guitarra flamenca, ¿no? Cuando a veces estás transcribiendo, digo, bueno, no puede ser que haya este salto, ¿no? A lo mejor el recurso más fácil, ¿no? También lo, la edad, digo, eh, por eso digo que Paco de Lucía hay muchos años, ¿no? Ya Paco de Lucía ya no busca en su, en su última época esa, esa rapidez, a lo mejor busca más la comodidad y buscar más la sí. mano derecha, darle, pues darle un toque más de dinámica, ¿no? Eh, y, he was saying that uh, David was saying that uh, uh, he was he couldn't use the videos for this last book because obviously he died before well, this album was reason, presented it was does, presented by is there any his, reason he didn't do something a lot easier and consult with Jose Mari because Jose Mari plays all this music in a duet with yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. with mm. Amir right they do this concert Yeah, yeah. And Samaria you never thought to yeah, yeah. take that route? Con Amir, make it no, easier? Hicieron, sí, hicieron. With Amir, they presented yeah, all this. They do this concert with this music. Pero no, no me he no fijado, la verdad, no me he fijado. Porque al final también es una interpretación de ellos. Entonces he intentado, pues bueno, pensar. Sí. Bueno, como llevo tanto tiempo transcribiendo otros discos, pues pensar un poco en la intuición de, de Paco, que bueno, que a lo mejor no he aceptado, o sí, pero bueno, eh, ahí está, y eso también. Lo podéis. Eso es. Sí. 
y, y es muchos años, ¿no? So it's, it's many years uh, uh, researching like the same materials, you know, knowing about uh, Paco de Lucía's life and work and transcribing every single note, you know, of the previous albums. I, I think at the end, you know, when you come to the al final album, you find some of these counterpoints that he was doing, very interesting counterpoints, and you find things from all those uh, uh, traditional flamenco elements, Hispan-American elements, and those coplas that, that he was saying in the documentary that her sister was singing to him when, when he was little. So, so I think... But he has to be acknowledged that he has made one of the greatest contributions to the music of Paco de Lucia by doing these transcriptions and making it available to just anyone. Unbelievable. Thank you. Enhorabuena por las transcripciones, David, por por tus estudios. Eh, 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 creo que hay algo muy importante que queda por hacer en torno a Paco. O Se han escrito biografías de distintas perspectivas, pero creo que falta una gran biografía musical de Paco. Eh, que eso no podemos hacerlo los periodistas, no podemos hacerlo otras personas que nos acerquemos como curiosos o como transeúntes al universo de Paco. Faustino ha hecho guías acústicas tanto en la en la caja roja, como en, ahora en el disco nuevo que sale, pero creo que es necesario estudiar a Paco desde la perspectiva fundamental, que es la de su música. Como compositor. Y, claro, y eso tenéis ahí un, un trabajo por hacer que ojalá os animéis a, a emprenderlo, mm, si os pilla, <risa> eh, eh, con poca cosa que hacer, porque eso también tendría como para 20 años. Eh, y hay una, una cuestión que me gustaría remarcar que respecto a Canción Andaluza que es el gusto de Paco por la copla que efectivamente le vino en parte por la madre que a la madre le gustaba más la portuguesa y le gustaba más Manolo Escobar que la copla en general y sobre todo por su hermana María la madre de José María y Bandera que cantaba la copla y tenía Paco una devoción absoluta hacia Marifé de Triana en varias ocasiones Paco me, me urgió casi a que se le tributara un homenaje a María Fe de Triana en Sevilla. Me dijo, yo estoy dispuesto a ir gratis, hay que hacer algo a María Fe antes de que muera. Y no se le hizo. Eh, yo creo que con María Fe se cometió una de las mayores injusticias institucionales de la historia de la música en Andalucía. Y ya es decir, que se han cometido muchas. ¿Quieres traducir? O lo hago yo. ¿Te tú? <laughs> I'm just going to summarize and, and translate a little bit. So um, the first part of Juan Jose's comment is that there have been a lot of biographies written about Paco, but there remains to be written a musical biography of Paco. And that would be a really important contribution that has yet to be made. And then the other um, part of his comment has to do with the influence of Marife de Triana and how um, and how how essential she is an influence to Paco and how he knew that and wanted to have an homenaje to her in Sevilla before she passed away and you know among many things that were left undone that that, that didn't happen. We have like five more minutes. And well, I was just curious. And I don't know if anybody else thinks this, por curiosidad, cuando uno pasa horas y horas transcribiendo música y después lo tiene fusilado y está apuntado y está listo, ¿qué te pasa a ti cuando tú estás en el carro y alguien pone un tema que tú pasaste horas transcribiendo, aprendiendo y eso? Sí, ¿en qué...? En qué ¿En qué te, te deja la música? Tú estás eh, como, tú puedes eh, escucharlo casualmente uh, eh, o est siempre estás pensando a, a pasar este proceso. This is a kind of nerdy question. I'm asking as an ethnomusicologist, when you spend all of this time transcribing this stuff and listening to it over and over again, and you get in your car and you hear it, or if someone's playing it casually or you see a musician playing it, what, what happens in your brain? ¿Qué te pasa en tu cerebro cuando tú encuentras la música después de hacer todo ese trabajo? 
Bueno, tengo que decir que cuando me meto a transcribir solo escucho ese disco. No, no me intento, no me meto en otra música, ni, ni mis piezas, no toco, solo toco a Paco en, en, en ese proceso. ¿Por qué? Porque inconscientemente el oído humano, cuando tú escuchas una cosa mil veces, si tú te has equivocado, ese fallo lo, lo conviertes en natural. Entonces, es un proceso de, de transcripción complicado. Tienes que dejarlo reposar y dices, venga, dentro de dos semanas recupero este tema a ver si lo he hecho bien o no. Y a veces, ostras, aquí me he equivocado. Aquí, ¿ves? Es que ya tenía el oído ya acostumbrado a, a otra cosa. Y entonces siempre intento tener como unas fases, que es una fase de, primero, eh, revisión general. Luego, cuando pongo la mano derecha, estoy revisando la, la digitación de mano derecha, hago otra pasada, la mano izquierda otra pasada, la dinámica otra pasada. Estoy obligado a, a revisarlo cinco veces. Porque, y y porque después, es... después, cuando está acabado, cuando... El... Ah, ya no lo escucho. Y después ya no lo quieres escuchar nunca más. Eh, hay una, Esa es la pregunta. Hay una cita, hay una cita muy no buena. Lo escucho, pero de, lo... ¿no? El documental de Francisco Sánchez, que él dice que, que escucha a un guitarrista que está en el coche y de repente dice, oye, qué bien toca este. Y de repente, inmediatamente, sa eh, es un tema suyo. Y dice, oye, pues qué, qué mal, qué mal. Qué... O sea, que tenía ese síndrome, ese síndrome del del estafador, ¿no? que, que se suele decir que, que, que de repente daba salto, ¿no? eso está también en la búsqueda, ¿no? daba salto de una cosa que había compuesto por la noche y la escuchaba por la mañana y decía, qué horror, qué horror, cómo pude componer eso, ¿no? esa idea de con cuál me quedo. ¿no? Y yo que me imagino que a David le pasa lo mismo, a mí me pasa cuando transcribo cosas, al final llega a tal saturación que dice, no quiero escuchar esto nunca más en mi vida. <risa> I'm going to just quickly translate that. So David said that he only, when he's transcribing, he only listens to that album. And he has to go over it many, many, many times in order to identify any possible errors that there are, which is, that's how it goes. So he does the right hand, he uses the left hand, and he looks, looks at the dynamics. Um, and, pa and Paco was just um, recounting an anecdote of how Paco de Lucia heard something on the radio. He was like, oh, that's a great song. And then afterwards he realized it was his own. He was like, oh no, that's terrible. It's what happens, you know, you, yeah. The, the, the critical eye of the artist. Yeah. Okay, one more question, anyone? Um, I think we're... Okay, we're out of time. Uh, we will continue with another session and that's it for it. Today, thank you so much, thank Paco and David. Gracias. Gracias. Bravo, bravo. Yes, um, actually, we're gonna. Ha we have 15 minutes as a conclusion to the conference. So, uh, any of the presenters, like yourself, if you want to come to the front, and if there are some questions, or if if you. Uh, want to interact, we have about 15 minutes before we really close. And uh, Miguel Marin uh, is going to moderate this last leg <laughs> of what has been a long but very fruitful, <laughs> and still is, and is going to be even better, you know, now <laughs> that we're going to go all to the concert. Yes, and w one of the things... Where's, where's Basilio? So, so one of the things that we, we had asked people to talk about and we would invite um, other people in the audience to share their thoughts about this is to think about what is the future of Paco de Lucia's legacy? What do you think, of, what do you think is the future of his legacy? ¿En español o en inglés? En inglés, ¿no? En inglés. Bueno, creo que este es un tema muy interesante, porque el futuro, porque si miramos, hay siempre todo este diálogo entre mantener la tradición y mantener la tradición y mantenerla viva, que a veces es una contradicción. It was very interesting that at the beginning of the century already in the, uh, in the in Congreso, 
del Cante Hondo, when Federico García Lorca organized this, uh, this was in 19... ¿Cuándo fue lo del Cante Hondo? 1920. El concurso del Cante, el concurso del Cante Hondo. Already, a hundred years ago, we were discussing that we have to preserve flamenco because it's going to get lost because all this evolution, all these new things that was discussed already a hundred years ago, more than a hundred years ago. So I think there is this um, very, the future, how to preserve, but how to keep it alive and evolve. So this is uh, yeah. a little bit, how to do this legacy of Paco de Lucia, keeping it alive, um, but continuing. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's connected to the concept of authenticity that is uh, also found in blues, in jazz, in many other musics. And, and flamenco is, when, they, when that PhD thesis we were talking about jazz, I see the period of freedom or the period. For me, flamenco is more alive than never and ever now at the moment. What is happening is, is all over the world and, and we just not try to keep it like Mairena, Uh, like in, in a cage no, of a bird, because then late at night he was singing cuples por bulería, you know? <laughs> so, so he already was, was uh, he has a discourse and then he was doing something else. So I think, uh, yeah, in relation to the concept of authenticity uh, as a cultural construction, historical and cultural construction, uh, we have to let flamenco to to continue and to develop and keeping the the root, no, the root, but... Yes. but uh, uh, and I find something in connection with what you say, that authenticity, um, sometimes we feel authenticity is if it is related to uh, what we know. Mm. But I feel that authenticity is if it is related with the inner drive of the personal artist. You are authentic if you are really doing what your heart is telling you to do, not if you are doing the same thing that somebody else has done in the past. So I think, and the audience can feel that. The audience can feel if you are authentic yeah. or if you are just you replicating know. something. Yeah, yes. It's like uh, this double reading of authenticity we can find in La Leyenda del Tiempo. Yes. Like for example, Tomatito is uh, very young, he's saying to, to Camarón, <laughs> Camarón, what are you doing? Are you going to record this uh, Kiko de Veneno song? You know? yes. And say, Jose said, don't worry, Tomatito, when I sing it, it will be flamenco. <laughs> so it's yes, like yes. two horses. No, yes. one try to what my people is gonna say, and on the other hand, Tomatito wanted to be a son or Paco to be a son of his time. Yes. yes, yes. A mí no me vaya a hacer hablar en inglés otra vez. <laughs> ya he hecho el ridículo una vez, así que eh, voy a intentar ser ser sintético. Creo que que el debate sobre la pureza del flamenco se ha superado, sobre todo porque el flamenco es uno de los grandes chuchos de la historia. Eh, sin el mestizaje, el flamenco no sería. El flamenco es una amalgama de músicas que viene de antiguo, que se han dejado ir unas con otras. Como Paco, a Paco le gustaba mucho la imagen de, de ser una hoja eh, que va en un, sobre un río y el río lleva esa hoja sin un destino eh, marcado y el flamenco es así. Afortunadamente, después del debate entre los mairenistas, qué gran creador fue Antonio Mairena, porque muchos de los cantes que se suponía que él rescataba del pasado, no hay constancia a, a, absoluta ni en partituras ni, ni en registros sonoros y por lo tanto cabe inferir que Mairena creó y creó uh, mucho. Eh, bueno, ya ese purismo del mairenismo ha sido sustituido por sus propios seguidores con una expresión más adecuada, que es el primitivismo. Mm. Eh, los cantes primitivos, que creo que sí es una eh, acepción eh, correcta. Y respecto al futuro, el flamenco es inescrutable. ¿Qué es el flamenco? Se preguntaba José Luis Ortiz Nuevo y se respondía lo que hacen los flamencos. Yeah. Aquí se ha hablado de, de Gerardo Núñez, por ejemplo. Gerardo me decía en una ocasión, es que a mí me da mucho coraje Paco de Lucía porque cuando tú has llegado a un sitio, Paco ya había estado. <risa> se refería a la música a la y música. se refería a la geografía, porque eh, esto ha ocurrido así. Ahora mmm, se sufre mucho 
eh, y hay a veces motivos para hacerlo porque se identifica como flamenco algo que no lo es. Pero bueno, quizás también sea un motivo de orgullo que eh, músicas que no tienen que ver con el flamenco por determinado um, en deje eh, um, se identifiquen con el flamenco aunque no lo sea. Eh, yo prefiero eh, enormemente mucho más a la Rosalía Trapera que la Rosalía Flamenca, eh, que lo es y que conoce los cantes. ¿Por dónde va a transcurrir el flamenco? La música electrónica tendrá mucho que decir. María José Yergo. Sí, María José Yergo. Eh, la semana que viene aquí. Eh, sí. y, y, y mucha otra gente que está trabajando en eso. El, el, ¿Qué hubiera sido eh, de Pago de Lucía sin el Pro Tools? ¿Qué le hubiera ocurrido a Camarón si hubiera conocido el Pro Tools? Con lo que le gustaba un cacharro pa, para grabar. Las nuevas tecnologías van a marcar el futuro del flamenco. Y lo peor es que probablemente no estemos para comprobarlo. I'll try to translate and summarize a little bit of that. Um, Juan José says that he thinks that the idea of purity has, we've gone beyond that. We've gone beyond that because it's obvious that flamenco is a mestizo form, it's a hybrid form, it's a syncretic form. And he said that we don't, where is flamenco going to go? Is It's like a leaf on a river, it's just, it's flowing. And he quoted Ortiz Nuevo who said that, you know, what is flamenco? It's what the flamenco people do. Um, and he said that it's interesting because we have this kind of um, theoretical framework, I'm going to say without, um, without being um, opinionated about it one way or another, and um, uh, which is from the mid 20th century of Antonio Mairena, we call it Mairenismo, and he would say, you know, he said that he was rescuing, he was re re recovering um, pure songs And of course, we know that he was an artist who was inventing things. You know, they're, they're his songs. And he said that, uh, Juan Jose says that there's now a kind of a different approach, which is, more, which is primitivism, you know, kind of looking, trying to look at the, the, the roots, if you will, you know, the, the genealogical, the, the family tree of all of this. And yet, you know, when we look at something that maybe doesn't even look like it's flamenco to us, Maybe it really is flamenco, and you know, Rosalia is a really good example of that. You know, someone who's out there in the world doing music that's kind of pop, we would say, and yet it's flamenco. Yes. I But, think that um, there's not enough emphasis on uh, Paco's contribution to evolving or revolutionizing rhythm and harmony in flamenco. I don't know what they call, what do you call the bass line in salsa when it's going doom, doom. Oh, tumbao. Tumbao. He incorporated this tumbao rhythm uh, when he recorded uh, Solo Quiero Caminar, and he recorded a song called Chanela. And from there, that totally evolved everybody's concept of flamenco, because usually they would end the phrase on a downbeat, but tumbao goes dum, 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 dum. And now everybody, those farrucos, singers, guitar players, everybody plays ending the phrase on the upbeat. So that's one of his greatest contributions. And then the other one was Gloria to a Nino Ricardo in the Sirocco record, where he just totally, instead of playing in one key and be restricted to playing in one key, let's say E, Phrygian. Just the first 12 bars, he must have went through five different tonal centers and totally did something that was never done before. And that totally opened up the possibilities of uh, creating a flamenco composition where you didn't have to be locked into one tonal center. And she, just in 12 measures, he must have went to five tonal centers. Oh. So those are things that I think should uh, be noted. Chanela and Gloria Tenino Ricardo, to me, were the greatest contributions, and I think he would be happy. I think that, that was his, his whole journey, his whole destiny, was to keep flamenco evolving and to keep it, then that way, keep it alive. Mm. And that's, uh, I think, where he came from. And now his wife, Gabriela, I think, made a statement. She was so happy 
after the concert of Arturo Ferro arranging Paco de Lucia's compositions for a big band, a jazz band. She said that would be the maximum for Paco to have heard and experienced that, that Arturo Ferro had arranged his music for big enough. band jazz. With a big band. And Paco, I think you had something to say, and, and John, of course. Yes, John, if, if you want. I just want to say a little mention when I say what flamencos do, but what is a flamenco? Because I think it's related to concert of identity or multi-identity. Meira, for me, she's a flamenco dancer. It doesn't matter where you come. There's amazing uh, dancers like Karen Lugo, who is from Mexico, and she's an incredible flamenco dancer doing this project with Chicuelo. And I was not born in a flamenco context, but flamenco has become part of my life and is part of my multi-identity. And for me, it's, it's interesting. I've been programming in the US for a long time. And what I say is that the con flamenco before, the concept was this. Mm. And it was relevant to um, very few theaters. Mm. Of course, Paco de Lucia make it from here to this. Many more theaters could relate to flamenco, and they were interesting and attractive to, to program flamenco. But now, flamenco is so big. Yeah. We can go to avant-garde theaters that they would never think about flamenco as something which is avant-garde. We can go to traditional, to uh, more contemporary, to music. To, so today, like in, in New York, we can go to 20 different venues that was not possible 10 years ago. And what you say about the foreigners, um, it's so interesting that um, last year, the first award as a dancer in, uh, in the context of uh, Madrid, Certamen de Coreografía, it was given to Yu Swain, a dancer that if you want to see her, she's at, with the National Ballet of Spain this weekend. I'm not doing promotion, but <laughs> she's a Thai, Taiwanese dancer. Wow. Amazing. So this, all this is happening now. It's really the, the concept of what is flamenco mm. is so big, and that is great. The flamenco was the first globalization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so I, I think in these discussions about purity, it's important to just bear in mind that it's very, very difficult to be objective. Um, and I love your metaphor about a, a leaf going down the river because it's inevitable that the leaf is going to go down the river regardless of what anybody, where anybody would wish that leaf would stop. Um, so like, like I said earlier, you know, we, we form our musical preferences early on in our lives and it's very difficult for us to, as, as, as humans, to, to expand those preferences. We can, but it's very difficult and we're going to be subjective about this. Um, I think one, like as you point out, Paco has ex greatly expanded the, the harmonic and musical aspect of flamenco, the jazzification of flamenco, the use of jazz chords, which were very limited um, a generation ago, now are ubiquitous among pretty much every guitarist, every professional guitarist in Spain. Mm -hmm. Not all guitarists do it, but it's, it's huge, and that's not gonna go back. You know, I often would hear people say, well, you know, at some point, the traditional flamenco will become the new flamenco. Um, I've been waiting for that for, for many, many years, and, um, <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. It's happening. It's happening, Israel, it's happening it, right how in the next door. And Israel Fernandez next week. You <laughs> yeah. will see. Well, so it's, yes, perhaps that's happening. But I also, but 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 you're not going to you're not going to put the genie back in the bottle with respect to the the the. Nope. But it's a it's a new movement that is that you are more contemporary if you know more your, your roots. Yes. You see singers now not singing like Camarón and singing like, but they're going back singing like La Niña Los Peines, uh, um, Sandra Carrasco singing like, uh, making a reinterpretation or recreation of uh, Pepe Marchena. So it's, it's amazing. So but, it's, but it's I, knowledge. It's knowledge of our Isabel past. Fernandez, so, uh, so, but I, I think, Related to that, there are these two, there, there are kind of two strands, right? So you have this very modern flamenco. You also have, for example, the flamenco that comes out of Jerez. Mm -hmm. You have someone like Diego del Morao, who can play very modern flamenco, but when he accompanies a singer, when he, for example, accompanies Antonio Reyes, you hardly even hear him. He's, he's vamping in the background so soft and so subtly and just giving exactly the, the very minimalist type of accompaniment that is that would be very, very pure. So I think we have these two forces, and um, how these two forces are going to negotiate the future is something 
um, we can just sit by the river and watch the leaves and see where they end up. Hay algo importante también en lo que está ocurriendo en el flamenco que es lo que en España llamamos la LOGSE, los sistemas educativos. Los flamencos tradicionalmente venían de un mundo analfabeto sin ningún tipo de conocimiento, de transmisión oral, con muchos complejos. Ahora los flamencos han cursado estudios, han profundizado, eh, tienen máster universitarios, carreras, etcétera. Saben lo que están haciendo, saben lo que quieren hacer. Antes eh, actuaban por impulso. No sé si esto es bueno o es malo para el arte, eh, pero es lo que es. Eh, una vez me preguntaron que qué diferencia advertía entre la relación de Enrique Morente y Manolo Sanlúcar como cantador y guitarrista y la de Paco de Lucía y Camarón. Eh, y yo les dije, una ocurrencia típica de periodista, que el, para mí Enrique Morente y Manolo Sanlúcar eran caballos de alta escuela y Paco y Camarón eran potros salvajes y eh, cada vez quedan menos potros salvajes en ese sentido eh, Paco tampoco lo, lo fue del todo y en la propia biografía de Paco como aquí eh, se ha dicho a lo largo de su vida hubo muchos Pacos el mismo Paco que adoraba escortar el cante es el que termina convirtiendo el cante en un instrumento más de sus estetos, sin ningún tipo de prelación. Y el que eh, Andrés Segovia criticaba el tiriririri, es el que termina en la sutileza de, de su interpretación, por ejemplo, que a mí me fascina, de Ojos Verdes. Eh, creo que es uno de sus ejemplos de cómo lo complejo puede parecer sencillo. And I'm going to try to translate that really quick. <laughs> um, let's see. So um, one of the big changes that Juan Jose is noticing in the flamenco world is now there's just education and training and conservatory training, and people are, you know, they're 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 more conscious of 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 the choices that they're making. They're making more kind of conscious choices, whereas flamenco has always been an oral tradition. It's been, you know, uh, cultivated among communities that, that just didn't have access to formal education. And so that's a big change. And Jose, Juan Jose says he's not sure, you know, if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but certainly, and then the other uh, observation that he makes is that there were many Pacos through the course of his life. And so, you know, the early Paco, um, uh, who you know really venerated the cante, you know, becomes someone at the end of his life who is using the cante just as another instrument, and he's taking um, songs like Ojos Verdes and and reinterpreting them in a in a completely new way. Yes, I would like to add something that what you say, because I think is there is it brings like a, a como se dice un faro like a lighthouse. Like the fact that artists that they are very young, that they have not lived in, let's say, romantic idea of Jerez, that you have for all the families, make a conscious decision that they want to have this particular, that first that they choose flamenco to be the, the way of expressing, but that we have Israel Fernandez, who really have a voice that you can, it can be from another century, yeah. that we have Alejandro Hurtado, yeah, you will see him today. It's like we are traveling back in the time. So I think it's, so yeah, the leave, the leave is going, <laughs> we don't know, but there is still a lot of, um, yeah, for flamenco, traditional flamenco that, that is being the base, there is hope, I don't know if that is the word, but yes. It's yeah, and I'm gonna add something to that, and then I'm just very quickly, and I know I'm, I don't want to be too much. I don't, I don't want to be too much of an academic here, but flamenco is haunted. We are haunted by our past, and the past never leaves us, even as much as we invent. That's me. Yes. Yeah. I would just say that um, I think in every genre, in every setting, in every country, we have um, people who kind of take the lantorcha and, 
and they bring it way, way far into the future, and then people are trying to catch up to them. And in many cases, they cross paths with other people who are like-minded. And I think Paco de Lucia is just, and an, uh, not this is not a, a short changing, but another example of, of an artist who was able to do that. We could look at great painters and think the same thing, other musicians and adjacent genres of jazz or classical music, but they are representative of, uh, they represent their generation. And while there, yes, there were other talented people around them who had uh, los recursos to, to go far, there's this one artist who kind of had the combination of all those hours practicing when he was a kid, coming here early and touring, you know, getting deep into the United States and Latin American music, and then being open and having the ability to um, transform over a, a long period of time. And all of these records, all records are documents of musicians at one moment in time. Um, so obviously the many Pacos, right? The young kid, the middle period, the later period, you know, we have, we have the benefit of looking at these records and saying at what moment in time, what information he was drawing on and so forth. So, I mean, I think in terms of legacy, you know, we're here now, I guess we'll find out in another 25 years what happens, but, you know, through the scholarship, through the transcriptions, through conferences, through other, I mean, that's that's how the this particularly, this particular legacy will will keep living. And in terms of, and in terms of popular culture, you know, who, who, who will be the next Paco de Lucia, you know, like we all said, it could come from anywhere and we won't know it because I don't think necessarily, you know, if we think back to, uh, I forgot who brought it up this morning, the, the, the was it Estelle, uh, in the, in the uh, the presentation with the with the with the um, twelve or fourteen people going into a little room and seeing him perform uh, two two pieces maybe and oh you have to come this is the next great guy but there were maybe ten people there they didn't know but you know over the years <laughs> it turns into millions of people but at the time you know they said oh yeah se tiene talento but nobody knew where it was where it was going to go. So the next Paco de Lucia could be around the corner, but it's a, it's a once in a generation for a genre occurrence. El, el problema estriba en, en, probablemente en eso mismo, en Félix Grande, eh, que creo que ha sido eh, eh, quien mejor ha escrito y ha descrito la personalidad de Paco eh, de Lucía, decía que en este tiempo no se puede tocar mal la guitarra, es imposible. El conocimiento que nos dan las nuevas tecnologías, las plataformas. Eh, en, en otro tiempo, en el tiempo en que Paco empezó a tocar, eh, era de transmisión oral. Era de ser, eh, el flamenco era una estación de cercanías. Y ahora estamos viviendo vuelos transatlánticos, no solo del flamenco, sino de la música. Y hay otra cosa importante. Durante mucho tiempo los flamencos conocían mucho del flamenco, pero no de otras músicas. Uh -huh. Y ya no ocurre eso. Uh -huh. Ya afortunadamente se están contaminando de conocimientos de, de otras músicas. Y creo que el mejor legado que podría darnos Paco de Lucía es que sus seguidores no sean Paco de Lucía. <laughs> and I'm going to try to translate that again really briefly. Um, so Juan Jose uh, says that one of the uh, most important things about the legacy of Paco, as, as, as Feliz Grande said, is that he, he just played the hell out of the guitar. Like you couldn't play the guitar more than, more than he did. And um, at, at the same time, Flamenco at one time was an art form as we were just, as Estela was describing, of a little room, a few people in a little room, and now it's just obviously a mediated, transatlantic, global form, the global stage. And he thinks that the, the best legacy that Paco de Lucia could have is that the next person, the next Paco, is not Paco de Lucia, but something else. And with there, I think we need to to wrap this amazing conversation up. I want to thank everyone so much for 
coming from near, from far. Thank you, Miguel, for helping us put it together. Antoni and the Foundation for Iberian Music. Yeah. And thank you very, all for coming. But very important, thank you, Mayra. <laughs> thank you, Antoni. Really, it has been an amazing work what you have done to bring this together, to give it this Paco de Lucia. Remember him and have this legacy. Thank you so much. Thank you.